Welcome to the latest episode of Mentors at Your Benchside. I'm Hannah Gamester, and today we'll be covering how to go about choosing a fluorescent protein. Whether you're just getting started working with fluorescent proteins and need help choosing the right one, or are already a seasoned pro, we hope to give you some insight into developments in the field and how to go about choosing a fluorescent protein for your work in the lab. You're probably familiar with green fluorescent protein, or GFP, which has had a long history in biotechnology with applications ranging from in vitro protein labeling to broader work investigating the structural properties and expression of cellular proteins. If you're keen to know more about the history of GFP, listen to the Microscopist episode featuring Martin Chalfie. The link is in the episode description. And in this podcast, he shares his role in the discovery and development of GFP. GFP and several of its variants, including EGFP, SFGFP, and MUGFP, are readily found in almost every biochemistry lab and are a go-to due to their popularity and availability. With that said, there are now hundreds of different tailored fluorescent proteins that you can choose from that can improve your experiments and projects. Not only are there options with very specific excitation and emission wavelengths, but new and diverse proteins exist that reduce toxicity and maximize brightness across the visible spectrum. In short, exploring the vast plethora of options in the fluorescent protein world is likely to improve your results as well as make you a better researcher. There are six key considerations to consider when choosing a fluorescent protein. The first is the brightness of the protein. Fluorescent proteins exhibit a wide range of brightness because of their individual properties and structure. While choosing the brightest protein in your chosen emission range might seem like a no-brainer, you'll want to keep in mind that the theoretical brightness doesn't always equate to practical brightness in your experimental setup. The actual brightness of your protein may vary due to folding differences based on what it's attached to or the cell line you're using. Consider testing multiple proteins that meet your experimental needs and establish a baseline with a control condition. The second consideration to take into account when choosing a fluorescent protein is the stability of the protein. As mentioned previously, if the fluorescent protein you choose doesn't fold correctly, it may not fluoresce at all. The structural integrity of the fluorophore may be altered or compromised depending on where and how it is linked. You may want to try linking your fluorescent protein at the C or the N terminus of your protein of interest to determine the best linkage. While C terminally tagged proteins are most common and behave as expected more often than N terminally tagged proteins, this is not always the case. Other factors such as the cell line and pH can affect fluorescent protein expression and therefore fluorescence. Luckily, directed evolution efforts have led to enhanced and ultra-stable fluorescent proteins that last longer in cell lines at higher temperatures and broad pH. Some can even remain active in cell line workflows that involve chemically harsh tissue clearing methods. The third consideration to take into account when picking your fluorescent protein is the photostability of the protein. Photobleaching is a property of all fluorophores, which results in the irreversible destruction of the fluorescent properties of the molecules. This includes fluorescent proteins. So for live cell imaging or other experiments with long time lapses, consider a fluorescent protein with high photostability. The longer the bleaching half-life, or the time for the initial emission rate of a number of photons per second to reduce by half, the more photostable the fluorescent protein will be. The fourth consideration to take into account is the toxicity of the fluorescence protein. Some fluorescent proteins have toxic effect on specific cell lines. Although this isn't often fully understood, cellular damage resulting 
from fluorescent protein expression can result from reactive oxygen species generation, initiation of apoptosis, damage by immune mechanisms, not to mention the tetramerization and aggregation behaviors of the proteins themselves. So take a good look at the proteins you consider and their effects on cells by reviewing the literature before diving too far into an experiment. The fifth consideration you need to take into account before choosing your fluorescent protein is your experimental setup. Your experimental limitations and expectations are probably the most critical factors in deciding which fluorescent protein to use. For instance, your experiment may require not one, but multiple fluorescent proteins that interact. For example, in a FRET experiment to determine the interactions of two targets. Or perhaps you're running an experiment that requires very little autofluorescence or has very specific kinetic or fluorescence turnover needs. Just as important, you'll need to verify that your protein of choice is compatible with your microscope optics and filter sets. Look to your colleagues, call facility staff and the literature to identify what your needs are and choose a fluorescent protein based on these factors. The final consideration to take into account is a practical one, and it's the cost and availability of the fluorescent protein. But luckily, nowadays, the genetic sequences of most commonly used fluorescent proteins are readily available and in a diverse array of vectors. So these days, obtaining and using fluorescent proteins is cheaper and easier than ever before. Should you consider a new fluorescent protein? Biochemists and biologists have been working relentlessly for decades to engineer new and improved fluorescent proteins to help resolve some of the issues li listed above. Often, a few changes at key locations in the protein can dramatically improve stability, brightness, and photostability. Even if you feel settled in using a particular protein, you should probably periodically review if it's the best choice for your work. One such example is with GFP. Consider the many varieties that exist beyond the wild type GFP today. Improvements are still ongoing for a diverse palette of fluorescent proteins. And since science is always marching forward, don't hesitate to explore alternatives to those that you or your lab haven't traditionally used. For example, developments in the field of split fluorescent proteins in which fragments of a protein reassemble to form fully functional versions have led to self-complementing epitope tagging systems. This technology allows researchers to add relatively small peptide tags rather than the whole protein, which can in turn allow for greater versatility and stability. One such, of ex one such example of this is the sun tag um, sequence which results in as many as 24 GFP monomers associating with a target protein. And you can find the link to the paper that describes this method in the episode description. Another example is the many new variants of m Cherry, the red fluorescent protein, which has been engineered with red fluoresce, which has been engineered with red shifted fluorescence and reduced cytotoxicity. There are lots of different fluorescent proteins to choose from, whether you want green, red, orange, yellow, or blue. Visit the article linked in the episode description to review our super helpful table of contents, which lists a wide range of fluorescent proteins and some of the key features which will be important when you're making your choice. There are also lots of different resources that can help you choose and use the right fluorescent protein. As we've mentioned, fluorescent proteins are more and more widely available and used in labs throughout the world. Gone are the days when receiving a plasmid bearing a protein producing gene of your choice, or worse yet, having to clone one yourself, was a multi-month ordeal. 
There are several resources that we'll go through now, which can be really useful um, in helping you select and procure your fluorescent proteins. The first is, of course, going to the published literature and seeing what's there. You can find lots of helpful resources in the published literature from looking at what fluorescent proteins others have used in your field of technique, keeping up to date with the new fluorescent proteins that come available, or through different reviews on the topic. And once again, we've listed links to these reviews in the episode description. Your lab and collaborators can also be an excellent source of information when it comes to choosing the right fluorescent protein. If your lab or surrounding labs and collaborators already use fluorescent proteins, then they may be able to provide a good recommendation for your specific application. They may even provide a suitable fluorescent protein. Using existing local resources can often be the most convenient and cost-effective option. Another resource you might want to consider using is a website called FPBase. And again, there's a link in the episode description. FPBase is an online database which provides pertinent fluorescent protein information, including sequences and evolutionary timelines for over 750 proteins. And they're constantly growing as users add entries. Their interactive spectra viewing and table with details such as oligomerization type, protein size, and brightness are especially useful for anyone looking to do a comprehensive search. Each entry includes the original protein it was derived from, allowing you to see how multiple version of a single protein are related. Another useful resource is the Olympus color palette. The Olympus color palette was developed by the microscopy company Olympus and it has a very detailed list of proteins on their website. Once again, the link can be found in the episode description. The proteins are organized by emission wavelength and include a brief history of several variants. Importantly, Olympus provides recommendation on filter types and further details pertinent to any cell microscopy user. Whilst it's not an exhaustive list of all variants, it is an excellent starting point for those new to using biological fluorophores. Another useful resource are the online plasmid repositories. So once you've decided on using a new cutting edge fluorescent protein for your, your work, you may need to obtain the genetic sequence in a vector which is suitable for transformation or transfection into your cell line. An example of this could be AdGene, which is a really well-known online repository, and they have a huge collection of plasmids. They've also conveniently organized a collection of plasmids harboring fluorescent protein genes and categorize them by use. You can custom order genetic sequences from companies like GeneWiz or Twist Bioscience and clone them into the vectors of your choice. The final resource you might want to use when it comes to choosing your fluorescent protein is, of course, Bite Size Bio. Bite Size Bio has a wealth of articles that review the basics of fluorophores and how to troubleshoot techniques. From palm imaging to automated imaging, we've got you covered. And don't forget to check out the Microscopist podcast episode featuring Rita Strack who engineered several improved variant of the red fluorescent protein, DS-RED. Again, you can find the link in the episode description. I think that's fluorescent proteins just about covered, and I hope it's been useful. And don't hesitate to subscribe to Mentors at Your Benchside for more help and advice at the Benchside. <laughs>